Hello everyone, this is Deborah Richardson and today I am putting the AP in Happy where accounts payable teams are empowered to protect the vendor master file from fraud. This podcast will give a voice to accounts payable team members by talking about the growing reality of cyber attacks in their world and which vendor setup and vendor management techniques they can apply to protect the vendor master file from fraud. Visit the Vendor Process Training Center to enroll in your choice of 55 plus training sessions that will help you and your team avoid fraud, compliance fines, and bad vendor data. Or just sign up to get access to Vendor Process FAQs and to attend weekly drop-in live Q&A sessions. Visit training.deborahrrichardson.com today. The link will be in the show notes. Check fraud has been on the increase since 2021. This episode contains 20 tips to avoid check fraud in the vendor process. How many can you implement? Keep listening. Welcome to episode 243, 20 tips to protect your company against check payment fraud. Now, I will say that back in February of 2023, I really had two things on check payment fraud because I had seen where there was an increase in fraud or reported increase in fraud. And then I kept seeing new scam alerts related to check payment fraud. And so I know I did some vendor master file tips of the week, but I did do episode 226 where I talked about why uh, check fraud was exploding right now. And so go ahead and check that out if you haven't listened to that episode. Again, it's episode 226. But but, um, the week before I did that, uh, I did a 30 minute webinar Um, called 20 Tips in 20 Minutes, How Vendor Teams Can Avoid Check Payment Fraud in 2023. And so I recently attended a couple of webinars and I also saw some other articles or posts out there about check payment fraud. As a matter of fact, the FTC uh, said that the United States Postal Service uh, just I gave advice that, you know, consumers, because the FTC is mostly consumers, the Federal Trade Commission, but they gave the advice that consumers shouldn't even send checks through the mail anymore. And so I thought, what a great time to give you access to this webinar that I did. Now you can listen to the audio. That's all great and nice. But if you want to, you can also watch the on-demand recording. And so I will leave a link to in the description for that on-demand recording. And you will also be able to download the PDF if you like as well. So go ahead and enjoy this webinar. And I will be back next week with some some fresh content. All right, now we are right at the top of the hour. You guys can see my screen. Uh, I am not showing my um, camera. Usually I do, but last time I had some technical issues. So we are just going to, uh, we're just going to leave that off. Yes, thanks, uh, Jennifer, Sophia, Dawn, uh, Anne, and again, Greg, another Greg. So thanks, guys. Um, So let's go ahead and get started to um, talk about how vendor teams can avoid check payment fraud in 2023. We're going to do 20 tips in 20 minutes. So this is going to go really fast. I do, however, want to remind you that this is part of a monthly webinar series in January. Um, We did uh, 20 tips in 20 minutes, how vendor teams can avoid business email compromise. So that was for ACH payments. Today, we're talking about check payments. And uh, you can't always go to my webinar um, 
page. And as these are posted, you can go ahead and just sign up. But I will have these um, different topic every month this year. Now, some housekeeping items. This session is being recorded. Um, tomorrow, by the same time, you will receive a link to the recording um, that will also let you download the handouts if you didn't get a chance to download them. Now, if you have any questions, you can submit them anytime. Uh, and uh, I'll save those for the Q&A session um, or section at the end. Not sure how much time we have, but if I don't get to answer them all, there'll be, um, I will reply via email within 24 hours. And if you think of questions afterwards, there will be an email that you can email me afterwards and I will respond um, within 24 hours to those. Now I do have two uh, handouts today. There is a present uh, PDF of the presentation and all of the links in the PDF uh, in the PDF version um, are clickable. So you'll be able to link out to um, all of the um, uh, all of the resources I included. And then I also have a training schedule for the Vendor Process Training Center that I'll talk about um, when I talk about a free um, training session that you can take. But that'll be later. And then really quick, a little bit about me, Deborah R. Richardson. You might have heard of me before by my saying, putting the AP in happy. I also have a podcast of the same name. Uh, and tomorrow, is tomorrow Thursday? Yes, tomorrow, because I publish every Thursday, I'll be on episode 225. So who knew there would be that much to talk about with a uh, vendor and the vendor setup and maintenance process and fraud and compliance. Now, a little bit about me. Um, I was a previous AP senior manager uh, over global vendor maintenance, and I was uh, responsible for a team of 17. And all we did was vendor setup and maintenance. And so we processed over 2,000 vendor requests per month, maintained 140,000 active global vendor records across seven different uh, ERPs. And so, um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of uh, opportunity for fraud. So myself and the payroll manager, since that was the other um, function where cyber criminals were, right, applying social engineering tactics, we implemented uh, over 70 authentication techniques, internal controls, and best practices to mitigate fraud for both the AP and the payroll teams. And so now I work... Um, I work with vendor teams that are still receiving vendor inquiries and requests via email uh, to avoid fraud, fines, and bad vendor data. And some of those um, authentication techniques, internal controls, and best practices are included in today's 20 tips. All right, so the agenda. First, we're gonna look at, yes, fraudsters are still targeting checks. Uh, and then we'll get into the 20 tips in 20 minutes about how to, it says business email compromise, but it is uh, to avoid um, check fraud in 2023. All right. Um, first, though, I am going to launch a poll question. Um, I have. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and launch it. And this is really um uh, asking, do you confirm remittance address changes, right? So if you have a, a check payment method and you have a change to the remittance address, do you uh, uh, confirm the same way that you do for bank change requests? So uh, one or A is yes, you do the confirmation call. B is yes, you do some type of a confirmation, but it's not the confirmation call, it's something else. C is no confirmation is done, and D is unsure. So let me, we've got about almost half that has uh, have voted. So go ahead and vote if you haven't voted already. All right, so I've got almost 70% that have voted. If you haven't, five more seconds. And then we will, okay, great, Wendy, thanks. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and let's take a look at um, the responses. So 
31 percent actually had a tie. So yes, other confirmation. So if you are doing other confirmation, go ahead and throw that in the question slash chat area. I'd love to hear what that is. So 31 percent. Um, also, the tie was with unsure. So they're doing an uh, other confirmation or they're not sure what they're doing. 27% um, is yes, they're doing that confirmation call. And if you are doing that confirmation call, um, I would love to hear what your pain points are. Um, I've seen or heard from clients um, with anything from, right, you can't get hold of them, um, to uh, they say they won't co confirm on, on a phone call, so you kind of hit a dead end. And so whatever pain points you have in trying to make that confirmation call, I would love to hear it. And then 12% says uh, say that there's no confirmation is done. And that is actually not surprising to me because uh, I've had um, uh, accounts payable teams or vendor teams, um, actually their leadership too, um, will say, uh, well, we don't have any issue with fraud because we pay by checks. Um, and that's just not realistic, especially not in today's world of fraud. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and hide that and you guys should be able to see my screen again. If you can't, throw it in the chat and let me know. But we are going to just start with, right, fraudsters are still targeting uh, checks. And uh, in the 2022 AFP Payments Fraud and Control Report, the Association for Finance Professionals found that checks continue to be the top payment method impacted by fraud in 2020. Now, 66% of payment professionals reporting check payment fraud activity um, or reported check, pay, uh, check fraud activity, um, which was down from 74% in 2019, but they attributed that to just a decrease in the number of checks that, um, that companies or the fact that uh, companies are uh, sending less checks. Okay. And then um, they did find, though, in that same report that check fraud, uh, check fraud remained at 66% in 2021. So in 2020 and 2021, it was 66%. Now, uh, I even posted right about check fraud in actually it was a year ago um, this month that fraudsters were stealing mail from your home. And you may have known that right um, from your home mailboxes. Um, but what surprised me, I don't know if it will surprise you, but they're also stealing it from the from the blue mailboxes. Right. They will steal the keys from the mailman and then get checks out of those blue boxes. So I didn't know that was going on um, until last year. And if you didn't know, I post these new scam alerts. Um, and unfortunately, it's been two to three um, per week uh, since um March of 2020. Uh, um, but if you're interested in that, you can click through, read this one, and then sign uh, sign up to be notified whenever I post new scam alerts. But this was one back from February of 2022. Now, you might be wondering, well, what the heck are Frosters doing with the checks? Um, and so keep in mind, this, this can be, check fraud can be perpetrated by internal employees, um, right, internal occupational fraud, or by, you know, fraudsters um, for that external fraud um, event. And so the first one is theft, right? So stealing checks for use in fraudulent pur uh, purposes. This is really big for internal um, internal team members where checks can be taken from the mail room or, um, again, the froster stealing the checks from um, a mailbox. And then uh, or redirecting your vendor's check to their address. Um, now, once they have the check, um, here's some things they can do with it. Right. Forgery, sign in the check without authorization or endorsing. Um, a check uh, on the back and, and making it payable to themselves, um, washing it, so using chemicals to review, uh, remove information from a check and then add their own, 
counterfeiting, so illegally printing checks using information from the checks, the victim's uh, check. Okay, and then, um, but I think one of the uh, bigger concerns too is also access to the remittance information. So now they have your vendor's invoice number structure, um, the average invoice amounts, right? Because the remittance information can be printed on the checks. Um, so now they have that information and they have uh, uh, better information to submit fake invoices, which gives them a better chance of getting those paid. So that remittance information can be valuable to them as well. All right, so now we're gonna start um, how vendor teams can avoid check fraud in 2023. And I say 20 tips in 20 minutes, but it has got to go faster than that um, because um, we've got about 18 minutes left. So I'll be talking fast. Um, keep in mind too that these 20 tips are uh, in itself are not magic bullets. It re they really need to be put into place, the ones that are applicable for you, as part of a full review of your vendor setup and maintenance process. All right, so let's go. So I separated these into categories. The first one is remittance address. So if you're having a received a request to change your vendor's remittance address. So the first thing is do not make uh, changes based on invoices. Require a process to change remit addresses. Don't make it easy for a froster. Um, require a process. And then when you get the request, uh, authenticate the requester. Make sure you are talking to, communicating with your vendor or internal team member and not a froster. So just like the bank does when you call them, ask them two to three identifying questions so you know you are not communicating um, with a froster, but rather with your vendor or internal team member. And then once you authenticate the requester, send them a uh, form in order to change their uh, remittance address. And on that form, uh, require certain information and that is called authenticate the requester, right? And uh, you're only sending that form after they authenticate. Um, but then when you receive the form, include information on the form so you can authenticate the data. I think I said it wrong the first time, but authenticate the requester and then include specific information on the form to authenticate uh, the data. And this can be, um, if they're asking for a change of remittance address, ask them for, um, have old uh, address and new address and ask them for the old address. Also include other fields um, like a regular vendor setup form, right? So that you can take that information and compare it to what's in your vendor master file. Plus um, it's an additional obstacle right, um, that fraudsters may just give up and go on to the next victim that's not asking all that information. And I talked about a form, um, a vendor setup form. How about create or combine that vendor setup form, right, going a step further, combine it with your vendor's W or with the IRS W-9 form. So the IRS allows a combination of um, a vendor setup form and their W-9 W-9 um, to create a substitute W-9. And so this way you can capture not only um, the before and after information by adding in, right, um, the old address, new address. You can do it with a tax ID. You can do it with an email address, right? Um, so not only can you capture more information, but now you can get an updated W-9 at the same time the vendor makes changes uh, and the vendor still only has to fill out one form. And the next one is to confirm the change. And for those of you that are out there that are unsure that 31%, I think it was 21% that didn't do anything, um, you wanna make sure you contact the vendor to confirm the change, same way you do for bank changes. So you can call the vendor um, to verify the change or create a, a new email string using the vendor's email address on file. But if you don't have a phone number or email address on file, 
now or you're unable to locate it elsewhere, right? Because not all vendors have a web presence and maybe they don't have a contract either, then send a physical letter. Better snail mail than hoping to recover a fraudulent payment that has been made. The next one is validation. So make sure you format and standardize the address. Um, you wanna make sure it's real, it's mailable, and that each team member is entering in the address the same way to avoid duplicates because duplicates can be an indicator of fraud. And at the very least, it can cause duplicate payments. And then next is verify the address status. So the address may be valid, it may be real and mailable, but is it vacant or is it inactive? Which means the check you send will end up coming back to the post office and then return to you. Um, also, it'll tell you if it's a PO box only address, right? Which some fraudsters hide behind. So that could be an indicator of fraud. Now you can use a company called smarty.com um, that will uh, validate both non-US and US addresses, formatting, standardizing, and they will give you that status. And I am going to put the, uh, the, uh, the link in the, uh, in the chat area. I'm not sure if you can see that, but it is smarty.com. So smarty, S-M-A-R-T-Y.com. And then from the accounting system and ERP side, you can send a notification to the vendor after the change. So this is the same experience that we have when we change our information on Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, or your bank, or whoever um, you deal with on, with an online profile. Um, include, you can send them right a notification that their information has changed and include contact information. So if they did not initiate the change, they can notify um, your team and they may be able to right, even notify you before you do your next check run. So you don't even send that check right to the froster because you've already been notified. Now, your accounting system or ERP may be able to be configured to send these automatically. Um, when I was a practitioner, we were able to send it automatically in SAP, um, but not PeopleSoft. But I know that can be uh, company specific how your uh, your uh, ERPs are configured. So work with your IT or system systems team to see if that's possible. And then check vendor records against employee records. So you can make sure the check is not being sent to the um, employee's address, right? Because remember, they're the ones that know where the gaps are. Um, have the systems team or IT set this up in the background to run continuously and then have them notify management if there's ever a match. All right, the next one or category is check printing. So uh, here, the first one is do not use pre-numbered or pre-printed pre checks. Use blank security paper. So if they're stolen, well, they just have paper. Um, the next one is do not use signature stamps. Have the accounting system or ERP add the signature. Or if you have signature plates, uh, make sure you store them in a separate location from the printer. Don't make it easy. Um, don't make it easy access for a thief. And according to Frank Abagnale's latest annual bulletin, volume 17, and yes, the one from the movie Catch Me If You Can, um, where he forged checks for years. Now, he recommends using high security checks with at least 10 security features. That includes watermarks, um, which foil copiers and scanners because the image is at a right angle. Um, also, micro printing of a word or a phrase where it's so small that um, when looking at it, it looks like a solid line. Or laid lines where it's unevenly spaced lines that appear on the back of the check. Um, it really makes it harder to cut and paste information such as payee name. And then reactive safety paper, which combats erasure and 
chemical alteration, which I talked about earlier, um, by discoloring, uh, discoloring the check if a forager tries to e erase or alter the information on the check. And I do have a link to his bulletin there. And then number 14 is once they are printed, do not leave checks for mailing in the mail room. That's a great way to be um, to be uh, to have ready, you know, uh, checks that are ready to be mailed to walk off, right, um, with uh, an internal employee. So keep them locked up until the mail person arrives. And then as we saw earlier, if you're taking them um, to the post office, do not drop them in the blue mailbox, park and go inside and then drop them in the slot. And then here's some things your banks um, can do. So one, set up positive uh, payee, positive pay. I still run into teams that do not have this set up. Um, and so this means the check must match the check number, amount, and the payee name um, that you sent in a separate file to the bank. Now, the other side of that is reverse positive pay. So if for some reason your company has a difficult time transmitting that positive pay file, um, then you can have the bank transmit a file to your company as checks are presented for clearing. Um, this is usually done in the morning and your company will have to compare it to the outstanding checks and let the bank know within a few hours if, um, which, if any, should not be uh, cleared. Um, and this can be done like temporarily until the transmission file is working. And then the next one is daily bank reconciliation. So a best practice is to have the applicable team or team member do a daily bank reconciliation. And then this way, um, any fraud or errors can be caught early. And you may already have someone doing this to um, uh, to uh, ward against the direct debits because that's a uh, a high fraud area now as well. All right, and then outsource and policy. These are the last three. So 18 is convert check payment vendors to card payment vendors. And I know that the big rush, uh, the big rush, especially after pan after the pandemic, is converting check payment vendors to ACH payment vendors. But the problem is if you do not have um, internal controls in place uh, to prevent all of the extra fraud that's going to come with the ACH payment, you're still in, you might solve one problem, but you've got even higher uh, higher trend of fraud with the banking details, especially if you're still receiving them via email. Um, so uh, uh, convert them to uh, to check pay or see if you convert can convert them to check payment method. It doesn't help, it uh, doesn't hurt uh, to ask, and if they say no, then convert them to an ACH payment, but not before asking. Um, and that process can be easier with this next one, which is outsource your vendor payments. So there are third-party payment solution providers that will take on all your payments, just send them a pay file, right? Um, and they love check payment vendors, by the way, since they are more probable to change to a card payment versus vendors that are already receiving ACH payments. Um, if the vendor still wants to be paid by check, they will issue the check. And if there is a remittance address change, they will handle that too. So now your team doesn't have to worry about the confirmation for that remittance address change. Um, they can just send them to the third party provider who that is all they do all day, um, every day. And so um, you, you will remove the, the risk from uh, your team. And then lastly, um, and if you attended last month for the business email compromise, um, this is the same one, create a vendor policy, right? So some of these changes, um, depending, may not go over well with the internals um, because they just want the vendor process to be easy. But as long as you're accepting vendor remittance details um, via email, it's just never going to be easy anymore. So add um, all of the uh, tips here and other um, uh, controls that you can put into place uh, and then put all of those in your vendor policy, have management sign off on them. Uh, 
so that you have support when the internal uh, comes uh, uh, screaming. I shouldn't say that when you have some uh, some feedback, because, uh, you know, sometimes the internals can be worse than than the vendor. So create that policy, have leadership sign off on it. All right. So I went a little fast with that. I do see I have a couple questions. Um, Really quickly, I talked about authentication, um, authenticating the requester. I do have a free training session on how to build an authentication matrix so your vendor team and help desk do not communicate with the froster. Um, the link there, you can go right to it. You'll have to sign up um, to the Vendor Process Training Center, but once you do, you'll have access to the training session, to Vendor Process uh, uh, frequently asked questions. I do have a library with vendor validation reference link, and then you can also join weekly Q&As, and I have a link to that too. It's every Friday from 12 to 2 Eastern. I'm there the whole two hours. You can drop in, ask your question, and then go on about your day. Um, here is how to uh, connect with me if you are interested. And then we've got about three minutes left for questions. If uh, I don't get to all of your questions, again, I will um, reply via email within 24 hours. And if you think of questions afterwards, you can always email me at info at deborahrichardson.com and I will reply um, within 24 hours. So I see two questions. If anyone has any other questions, go ahead and throw, uh, throw them in the question slash chat area. But the first one is, will you post the link in the chat for us to sign up for regular notifications of fraud alerts? Hey, I should have done that. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I did not. But um, if you if you go to or use the, the link that is in that uh, new scam alert, you'll see that you can click um, and I think uh, you can click to go to uh, the Vendor Process Training Center where you can sign up for that. Um, I should have put that in there. Thanks, thanks for reminding me. But I do have links for the Vendor Process Training Center um, directly. It's here, training.deborahrrichardson.com. Uh, and just go in the menu and look for new scam alert and you'll be able to sign up um, for those. As soon as I post them, um, the next day you'll get an uh, email with all the cumulative um, links to the post and you can see those right away. Um, the next question is, can you expand on how do you how uh, on do not use pre-printed or pre-numbered um, checks? And so um, I know that there are two schools of thought on that. Uh, some feel that the pre-numbered or pre-printed checks um, will uh, save you because or will be better because now if one is missing, you will be able to tell. Um, but the um, uh, the the ones that are uh, that are mostly used now are the are using the uh, blank uh, blank paper and again that is also included on Frank Abagnale's uh, bulletin the volume 17 of uh, how to avoid fraud and he does that like every year but I understand where you're coming from that uh, coming from with that because the uh, school of thought before the blank paper was to use the pre-printed. So if anything's missing, you would be able to tell. But what outweighed that is the blank paper. So now they don't have any information at all from your company, including that routing number and your bank account number that is printed on the bottom. So, um, uh, but I get where you're coming from. Thanks for that question, Greg. And Thanks, Tracy, for the one with the link. So we've got, we're right at 1.30. I can stay a little bit longer if anyone has any other questions, but I don't see any coming in. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate you attending, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye, guys. Thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the 243rd episode of the Putting the AP in Happy podcast, where accounts payable teams are empowered to protect the vendor master file from fraud. Don't forget to check the show notes for the links mentioned in the podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing and writing a review of my podcast on the platform that you use to listen. Stay happy. Stay happy.